Bioindividual Nutrition Insights. Hi, I'm Julie Matthews, the founder of the Bioindividual Nutrition Institute. Thanks for joining me here. I love diving into the research and sharing studies, and I must read dozens of papers a week. So some of you may know I'm getting my master's in medical nutrition right now. So in my day-to-day -day life, I spend a lot of time doing research anyway for writing articles. I'm in the middle of writing a book uh, and uh, add to that my master's degree. So I am reading tons of science. And for those of you who know, I love nutrition research. I consider myself a nutrition nerd and love to talk about the science. So I wanted to share with you on this channel more about some of the research and uh, share with you some of my favorite articles. So this one is called Metabolic endotype and related genotypes are associated with oxidative stress in children with autism. And this is by a woman whose research I find incredibly compelling and a, you know, a very significant contribution to the field. And that is Dr. Jill James. And so uh, you can, I would highly recommend you check out the paper. Um, I want to share a little bit about it with you today. So this is a, I'm just, kind of reading from the paper right now. Um, so to share some information with you. So what they did was they looked at the metabolites of the methionine transmethylation and transsulfuration pathways of 80 children with autism and 73 controls. So this was a, an observational study that they did looking at these levels in people. And in addition to looking at these metabolites, they look also looked at genes. So one of the things that I think is really exciting in the world of nutrition is all of the research in what we call omics research. And those are metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, and the list goes on. And basically what these are are little... Uh, molecules or um, chemical compounds and things that can give us really good information on what is going on underlying the system. So when we look at genomics or our genes, and uh, when we look at nutrigenomics and how foods affect our genes or nutrigenetics and how our genes affect the foods and the nutrients in our body and those that we need. Um, there are so many interesting areas of science today, and they're really, really gaining a lot of momentum as we get more research methods, laboratory methods, and more science that's out there. But there's already great information. And so when we look at genetics, we can see what genes people have. We can see where they have some variants or what we would call polymorph polymorphisms or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is a single chain change in one nucleotide in the gene. And that one single change can sometimes change the creation of the protein. And that will change the enzyme and how it functions at times. And that can affect our nutrition. And so when we look at that, we get a sense that, ah, this person's got some, uh, some, you know, some different variants in their genes that might be affecting them nutritionally. But there are so many genes, so many variants, and so many other factors that when we, it's hard to get a really good sense of, you know, is that gene expressing and how does that gene combine with other things? And because of that, we can't always get a complete picture of what that means nutritionally. So metabolomics brings in an entirely additional piece of data that can really help us figure out what is actually going on on that molecular level or that biochemical level or that uh, metabolic level. And so that's what I love about this paper is it brings together both the genes and the metabolites to give a bigger picture of what's going on. And I love this paper for that reason. So they also looked in addition to a variety of nutrients or metabolites, uh, they looked at different genes and they looked at reduced folate carrier, transcobalamin 2, uh, catechol O-methyltransferase and uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, um, as well as um, 
GST, which is a gene for glutathione. I will share with you a, um, a chart that I think would be helpful. So this is a bit more about methylation and transsulfuration. And I think that this can be a good framework for getting us started on our conversation today. So what they're looking at are a variety of different genes as well as the metabolites of this process. So some of the things that they looked at were within the methionine cycle up here, there are a variety of things that happen. So homocysteine is recycled to methionine and then that comes back down and around to create SAMe and that is the methyl donor or the methyl group for methylation of all sorts of things, including methylating our DNA for gene expression, as well as um, our neurotransmitters, proteins, and all sorts of other things. And so we need methylation working well. And, and so there are two pathways that help this recycling. And so one of the things they talked about was this homocysteine to methionine and the need for this folate cycle and MTHFR creating enough, enough methylfolate or active folate to then cycle this back around up here. And so they found that methionine levels as well as SAM levels and this SAMSA ratio were different and were decreased in children with autism, which means their methylation is going to be decreased. They also, so also some of this, when we get to homocysteine, some of it goes down this pathway of transsulfuration, which is also important because we need to be, be able to create glutathione, which is our major master antioxidant. And that is gonna help reduce oxidative stress. So they found in this study that there was uh, cysteine, so here, cysteine, as well as total glutathione and free reduced glutathione were decreased. Now, we want reduced glutathione. It, it sounds Sometimes it's, I always find it a little confusing. Oxidized glutathione is the negative glutathione we don't want. Reduced glutathione is the good form of glutathione that we need. So they found that cysteine, total glutathione, and free reduced glutathione were all decreased. So this pathway methylation is not working so well in people with autism, and this transsulfuration pathway is also not working very efficiently, which means we don't have good methylation and we don't have good antioxidant support in autism. So that's some of what this paper showed was looking at the, uh, the metabolites of these pathways. They also looked at genes and they looked at some of the genes that are on here, but they also looked at some that were not on here that, and they found that what, they, what we call RFC, which is reduced folate carrier, and TCN2, which is transcobalamin 2, as well as COMT, which is that methyl, um, sorry, which is the um, catechol O methyl transferase. Those three genes they found were had polymorphisms that were contributing to decreased levels of folate. So while that, okay, so um, RFC is the gene that is going to help this methyl transferase get absorbed or um, tr transferred inside the cell for use inside the cell. So while they're, so folate would be decreased in this case. They also looked at um, the transcobalamin 2, so they weren't necessarily looking at this gene here in this sense, but they were looking at also this transcobalamin 2 is the gene that helps trans also um, uh, transport B12 into the cell. So the gene that the genes that transport folate and B12 into the cell were diminished in this study of people with autism, and also this COMT, which is a gene that helps to make sure that 
dopamine gets methylated, which means dopamine then gets inactivated because we need neurotransmitters, but we also can't have too many of them because if we have too many, we also have negative ramifications on that side. Uh, there were some um, increased frequencies in MTHFR, which is C677T, which is uh, one of these genes here, as well as GST, which is one of the glutathione genes, um, but they were of borderline significance. They uh, then also, they found that while some of them individually may not have been as significant, the combination of them together was significant. They found that the interaction between RFC and MTHFR, and there's different ones, okay? So you might want to go to the paper so you can find out the exactly the SNPs that they were talking about. But these particular SNPs, um, when they were um, when they're found together, are expected to reduce methylfolate availability for in this process, and that does make a lot of sense. That's what I was mentioning before. So they they um, they mentioned that. They also were saying that uh, so and the RFC and the MTHFR um, together, when those SNPs were found, had a threefold increase in the susceptibility of having autism. So while the MTHFR alone in this case, they didn't find that to be associated with an increased risk of autism, although other papers show that it is, the combination of those two together, they did find that was um, associated with increased rates of autism. They also found that uh, TCN2 and COMT when these were found together, there was a seven-fold increased risk of having autism. So that's really very significant. And um, they also found that when our, um, reduced folate carrier RFC and the GSTM1, when the when SNPs in those genes um, went with you know certain versions of those genes, they found a 3.78 fold increase in the susceptibility of autism as well. And so, um, and, and and also depending on if they were homozygous or heterozygous, you know there was either an increase or a slight change in the risk, but both of them having risk there. So those are just a few highlights from the study. I won't go into too much of it. I think the most exciting part of this paper was that they pulled together the the polymorphisms and the metabolites and looked at them as a big picture. And I think that's really valuable because sometimes if we just are looking at one thing at a time, um, it's hard to see good patterns or, um, you know, we just don't get a full picture. But by looking at not only the SNPs, but the SNPs in combination and looking at the metabolites really paints a picture of understanding that people with autism have deficiencies in methylation and in transsulfuration, which impacts their oxidative stress and their ability to methylate all sorts of important um, neurotransmitters as well as our DNA. And when we can't have good DNA methylation, we don't have good gene expression. Gene expression is really important to be able to regulate the genes that we need on and off to maintain good health. All right, everyone, I hope you found that paper as interesting as I did. And I will make sure that I put a link to the paper and a citation for it so you have all the details for that in the notes of this video. So thanks everyone. Again, I'm Julie Matthews with the Bioindividual Nutrition Institute.